So I have a little, so first I want to mention the new, the first homework will be released on Wednesday. So that's the eighth. So the homework one will be released on 9, 8, 21. And it will be back due on 9, 15, 21 before class. I'm still trying to figure out whether to do it through Gradescope or over here. The advantages of Gradescope is, it looks like most of you are attending the class, which is good, but some of you who are not for whatever reason can still do it that way. And uh, also it's, you don't have to have a stack of papers over here. You don't have to print things. But for those who haven't done it, it's a bit clumsy the first time. So maybe we'll try grade school first time and see how it goes. And there will be an office hour for, for the TA in for Connor in between these two. He will take a poll online on the Slack channel and uh, see which, what time works for everyone. This homework will have material that we cover uh, till today. Basically it will be based on that. It will also have some multivariable calculus because starting the end of next week, we are gonna get deep into calculus domain. There will be lots of partial derivatives and now is the time to start brushing it up. Some of you have already looked at the problems. There are two possibilities. Either you are good at calculus or you suck at calculus. If you're good at calculus, you should go and look at those things and make sure that you are indeed good at calculus. If you suck at calculus, now is the time to go and work on those problems. You have still have 10 days to become comfortable with it. Please do that. Otherwise, end of next week, thermo will start picking up. And then if you are not good in multivariable calculus, it, it, it will become sort of a suffer fest. And it's a good idea to really start brushing up right now. So any questions about homework? Okay, and as I mentioned, your worst homework will be excluded from grade calculation. So, but that doesn't mean you should assume this can be the worst homework because it took it harder starting here, okay? So I last time we talked about uh, the ideal gas law and we talked about the concept of pressure and temperature and let's continue that discussion. In fact, let's look at something which might seem like a puzzle. At least once we didn't, it seemed like a puzzle and I was happy to see that. So the puzzle is as follows. I mentioned last time that pressure is proportional to rate of change of momentum, right? And which momentum are we talking about? We are talking about the momentum experienced by the walls of the container, right? We have a container in which the gas molecules are inside and they are constantly going and bombarding against all possible walls. And it is the rate of change of momentum that results from bombarding against these walls that really leads to pressure. But the key idea here was that pressure somehow is related to something like the change of velocity, right? And then we also talked about temperature and we said temperature is related to kinetic energy, which means it is proportional to velocity squared. And then we said these things followed for an ideal gas. So this is a recap for those of you who are just looking at the notes later. And then we said for an ideal gas at a fixed volume, so for an ideal gas, PV is equal to NRT. So at a fixed volume, this means that pressure is proportional to temperature, right? So if you look at equation one, if you look at equation two, and if you look at equation three, do you see a contradiction? What's the contradiction here? Something is strange. Anyone? Go ahead. Yeah, so there's a problem, right? We are saying that pressure is proportional to velocity, temperature is proportional to velocity squared, yet they are proportional to each other. So something, something is a bit funky. And let's look at it carefully. And the key thing that will come into account is that it's not really change in velocity, it's change in velocity per unit time. And we have to look at this a bit more carefully. So let's do that. And this will really show us how physics can help in chemistry. So for this, let's draw our box this container a bit more cleanly. So we have a container and, and the thing that I'm going to do next has a name. It is called the kinetic theory or kinetic model of gases. Okay. So again, I'm mirroring Atkin more or less. So it's there if you get confused in that book. So we are looking at a box. And uh, in this box, we 
we have a bunch of gas molecules that are randomly moving you know, in different directions. And once in a while, they collide with each other. So this, this kinetic model of gases assumes perfect gas. And last time we studied about perfect gas, if you go to those notes, we assumed five properties of perfect gas. Just to recap, they are gas particles that are indistinguishable hard spheres. So I don't have a sphere anywhere around here, but you can imagine it's like a hard sphere of radius r such that the radius r is much smaller than the typical distance between two molecules or two particles, right? So it's really tiny gas, tiny hard spheres. These are always moving. They are oblivious of each other as they move, except once in a while they will collide because there are a finite number of them. When they collide, they undergo an elastic collision and just keep going back in the other way. So they can't step on top of each other. When that happens, they just collide in elastically and go back. And uh, yeah, and they also collide with the container with the walls of the container. So this is the perfect gas. Let's start with this and let's try to think about how pressure comes. So in order to do this, let's think of the area of the wall first, okay? Let's think of this area, this shaded area as it, it has some area A. And uh, let's try to calculate pressure for this. So, and we will try to think of things that come and bombard against this side of the wall, this side of the box. It could be any side, let's just focus on one side. Let's say that this side is given by the X direction, right? Okay, so this plane over here is the one that has the X direction going perpendicular to it. So we have a molecule that was moving in some direction. It will go and collide. When it collides, it will come back something like this, okay? So since we are interested in X direction, we can focus just on the X component of this velocity. The X component of the velocity will be given by Vx, right? So before collision, the X component of the momentum was plus MVx. Since it's an inelastic collision, uh, sorry, since it's an elastic collision, after collision, the X component will be minus MVX, right? Along that direction, it just goes back exactly the same way. The component is preserved. That's the meaning of elastic collision. So since our collisions are all elastic, we have elastic collisions only going on. Okay. So after collision, it's going to be PX is equal to minus MVX. So, what is the change of momentum during this process then? Delta P, the amount, and you can worry about the sign, but I'm just gonna define it as initial minus final, right? So it's two MVX, is that clear to everyone? We have plus MVX, and from that is subtracted minus MVX, right? So this is plus MVX minus minus MVX, that's what we got. This is the change in momentum for one gas molecule, right? It's not just that there is only one gas molecule in the box which is bombarding against the walls. We have to take into account there are more gas molecules at the same time. So the total change of momentum in a unit time delta P, in a unit time delta T is not just this. It's given by, in order to consider it, we have to look at, so the total change of momentum will be delta P multiplied by number of molecules that can reach the wall within that time interval delta T. So we have, let's, let me try to draw it over here. So we have to think of, I was never very good at drawing, but hopefully that makes sense, right? So you have that wall, and I'm asking you to consider a little area next to this wall of this much thickness, right? And keep in mind that our thickness is dictated by the unit time, delta T that we are interested in. And the speed is Vx. So if the speed is Vx, 
and the time is delta t, then what thickness should we consider for this green thing? Vx multiplied by delta t, right? Because distance is speed multiplied by time. So we are interested in something that is of thickness Vx multiplied by delta t. So in order to calculate the total change of momentum, we have to look at delta p multiplied by number of molecules that are in this little green patch that I drew over here that can reach the wall in that. So let me write it down. So delta P multiplied by number of molecules that can reach the wall in delta P. Okay, so I'm gonna draw it here just as, as we proceed further. And it should be signed on this point This is the thing that we are trying to consider. And this thing is going to have a thickness given by Vx multiplied by delta t, okay? Because I'm gonna scroll the page and go to next side. So, okay. So just to recap, we are saying that total change in momentum in time delta t will be given by change in momentum due to one particle that is delta p multiplied by number of particles that can reach the wall in delta t. So it's, it's a simple idea. We said that for one particle, the change in momentum is going to be 2m multiplied by vx. Let's say there are 200 of you. Should I multiply 2m vx by 200 to calculate the change of time, change of momentum? No, because out of this 200, most of you will be colliding in some other direction. You won't be colliding against that wall because delta T is small. If delta T was very large, then sure you would come and collide with that, but we are thinking about a small delta T. So we know this two P, delta P, delta P is 2M Vx. We just calculated that over here, right? Delta P is equal to 2M multiplied by Vx. Now let's calculate this number of particles that can reach the wall. In order to find this, let's call this as some N prime, okay? where n is total number of particles, total number of particles. So what can we say about n prime? Will it be more than n, equal to n, smaller than n? Smaller, is there anyone who thinks it can be more than n? I saw some kind of funky chemical reaction going on. No, even then it's not possible, right? It's gotta be less than n that we know, but definitely n prime is less than n. But how much less than n? How do we calculate that? In order to do that, let's focus on that box that I drew over here and just draw that box, okay? And then look at it. Something like this, okay? It's kind of funky on the edges, but. So we know that the area over here is A, right? I wrote, I defined it that way, that the area is A. And we said that the thickness is Vx delta T. So N prime, and let's say the volume of the whole box, let's say the volume of the whole box is V right, uh, box, box volume is equal to V. So if box volume is equal to V, then can anyone help me? How should N prime be connected to N? So you have two pieces of information. You know that the volume of this tiny box, the area of this thing is A and its thickness is Vx delta T and the volume of the whole box is capital V. So what should I write over here? Go ahead. So in the denominator, what should I write? 
over Vn in the numerator? Multiplied by n. n is over here, right? Yes. Do I have anything over here in this numerator? Yes. And A, don't forget A, okay. right? Why did we do this? This is the volume of this little tiny box that is on that edge, right? The tiny box has the volume Vx delta T multiplied by A. The big box has the volume V. So we took the ratio of all that. This is missing one thing. It is missing a factor of half because half the molecules are moving towards the wall and half the molecules are moving away from the wall, right? So you have to multiply by that half. So this is going to be N prime, okay? So N prime is going to be N Vx delta T multiplied by A divided by two V. So let me recap once again. N is the total number of molecules in the box. Capital V is the total volume of the box. Vx delta T multiplied by A is the volume of this little patch. So we take that ratio and then we say that half of the molecules at any point are moving this way and half of the molecules are moving this way. Why? Because everything is random. It's a random world inside it. There are no interactions. So we got our n prime. So let's call our this equation total change in momentum in time delta t as equation number one. And let's call n prime equation as equation number two. So use two in one to get momentum change as 2mvx multiplied by nvx delta t a to v. Maybe some of you already start to see that our contradiction is starting to resolve. We already have a square of velocity showing up. Do you see that? And the reason this happened is because last time when we wrote delta v by delta t, we ignored that there is a certain number of molecules that are going to interact. And that itself is proportional to speed. The faster the molecules are moving, the faster they are going to bombard against the wall, right? And the pressure will be even more. So the pressure increases as square of velocity, which you can already see here. So this thing is then two, two can cancel. And this will become A multiplied by Vx, A multiplied by Vx squared divided by delta T and multiplied by delta T divided by volume. And uh, M, n okay and uh, we know this is momentum change what is force force is momentum change in unit time right and what is pressure pressure is force by area so force is equal to this thing divided by delta t so you can just remove delta t force is equal to momentum change by delta T is equal to A Vx square by capital V Mn and pressure is equal to force by area is equal to Vx square by capital V Mn. And this is equation three and we have looked at pressure in a more fundamental way now. The pressure against X direction wall is Vx squared by Vmn. So those of you who really like matrices, I can tell you that pressure is essentially a property of a complicated matrix known as the stress tensor. So you are here looking at the diagonal element of that stress tensor. That's why it has a Vx, but we don't have to worry about that right now. So we, but, but we solved our main problem. Last time we said, that the pressure is proportional to delta V by delta T. And if you just look at that, it looks a bit strange because temperature is proportional to velocity squared. So what's going on now? We see that even though pressure is proportional to change of momentum, we have to take into account that this is the change of momentum of one particle. And the number of particles that are hitting against the wall is also proportional to velocity. So in pressure, we get a square dependence on velocity. Those of you who are able to join the class late, I understand there might be 50 different reasons. The shuttles are still complicated and it's okay. As long as you have a genuine reason to be to class, be late to class, you don't have to explain to me what's the genuine reason. The videos are on online and I think the recording is working smoothly. So if you miss anything, please go back and 
uh, look at the videos. I mean, I started doing the videos because I thought we might just go back to, you know, like a work from home thing. But even if we don't do that, I think, I think it's useful to have videos so we can go and look at the material. So, so we have just shown that pressure is equal to N M capital N M V X square by volume. So that's fine. Uh, let's call it as equation number four. The question now is what is Vx? What is the speed which with molecules travel inside a container? Let's try to think about the probability of observing. So this probability is also going to use, in, in English we have only 26 letters. So sometimes symbols get overused. In my mother tongue, which is Hindi, we have 52 letters. So maybe I should switch to Hindi. Maybe I'll have more options, but then you won't know what my letters read like. You know, I will write something like ka. Like I have no idea what that is. I think in, in Mandarin, we have even more letters. Does anyone know how many letters we have in Mandarin? Like 200 or infinite? You can do calligraphy, right? So it just increases more and more, but it's very complicated. So we, we will have some symbol overuse. So P is pressure, but P is also probability. And I will try to be explicit as to what we mean. Normally it will be clear because anytime we write probability, it will be as a function of something. Pressure is normally not written as a function of something, okay? And the other thing is for pressure, normally I will use the small symbol P. So let's talk about the probability. So we just showed that pressure is proportional to Vx squared, but the question is what is Vx? How do we know what is the speed with which molecules travel inside a box? So we want to think about the probability distribution of observing molecules with a given speed. So let's think about it. What should this probability distribution look like at absolute zero? At t is equal to zero, what should this probability distribution look like? Any ideas? Go ahead. So point blank on the zero. This? So along where? Uh... Horizontal or vertical? Vertical. Do you know what's the name for such a vertical function in math? Huh? Delta. It's a Dirac delta function, right? It's a delta function. It's very sharp. So at zero temperature, you're, you're correct. So physically, what does this mean? Only one speed is possible at absolute zero, right? All motion ceases. We, we all go to zero speed. The question now is what happens as I increase the temperature? As I increase the temperature, let's say I go to T is equal to 50 Kelvin. How should this delta function that is just one sharp line, how should it change? Should it move to the right? Should it move to the left? Should it stay like right? Any ideas? Yeah, so it should become broader, but should it move to the left or right? Are you sure it should move to the right? On an average, what should be the speed, uh, the velocity? Velocity zero. Zero, on an average, the velocity. So you're absolutely correct that it would broaden, but it would broaden this way. On an average, if you observe, so keep in mind, we are not talking about speed. We are talking about component of the momentum, right? And this is something you all should, hopefully remember from like high school or middle school, speed goes from zero to the speed of light, right? You can't really exceed the speed of light, even though every once in a while you will find some quack articles on the internet, so-and-so proves Einstein was wrong, you can exceed speed of light, but we know you cannot. So speed can go from zero to speed of light, but velocity can go from minus C to plus C, right? Velocity can be negative, the component can be negative. The point though is that since we don't have any preferred direction, they will just start, so what this is telling you is they start to move more and more, but to the right, to the left with equal probability. As we keep increasing the temperature, let's say we go to T is equal to 500 Kelvin, this curve will become broader and broader. And that's the probability distribution of the velocity. So, <clears throat> Whenever we talk about probability distributions, there are two things that come to mind. And again, if any of you did look at my math modules and I can see from the, 
number of hits that many of you did, when you talk about a probability distribution, the first thing that you talk about is the average value of the thing that we are calculating probability of. So what is the average value of Vx here? Zero, right? It can go to the left, it can go to the right. At any temperature, average value of Vx is equal to zero. And same thing applies to average value of Vy or average value of Vz. The thing to keep in mind is this is true at all temperatures. However, if you look at the average value of Vx squared, that's increasing, right? As the curve is broadening, average value of, of Vx squared continues to increase and increase and increase. Vx squared increases the average value and this, this, this symbol that you drew over here, that I drew over here is called uh, bracket notation. It was introduced by Dirac when you take uh, 482, you will be seeing this a lot. What it really means is average, average of two things. It's a sophisticated way of writing averages. When you do quantum mechanics, it starts to matter more and more and more. And then it, it becomes really interesting. But we are not doing quantum in this class. In this class, Planck's constant is zero, okay? So Vx square increases as temperature increases. And since we are assuming isotropic things. You know, we are not really distinguishing X from Y from Z. We can say that Vx square is equal to Vy square is equal to Vz square. And remember, we are not talking about one value of velocity. This would be one value of Vx and there you have one value of Vx square. We are talking about an average over the probability distribution, okay? So this means that the average value of the speed itself will be given by should I do it this way wait one minute yeah should be given uh, should be given by this and this is in turn equal to three times average value of Vx square, right? So let me number the equations just to be, so if you have questions later, you can ask me, this is equation number five. And the fact that all of them are equal is equation number seven. And this thing becomes equation, uh, that's equation number six, this becomes equation number seven. So therefore, average value of Vx square is one three, one thirds of average value of V squared. So, This average value of V squared is, has a name. It's called the root mean squared velocity or VRMS. So this thing is one by three VRMS squared. And note that I removed the averaging operation from over here. So, over here, I did not use those brackets, those angular brackets. That averaging is already assumed in the root mean square. It is just a name for that average of V square. So, so we have just shown that average value of Vx square is equal to one by three V RMS square. Let's call it as equation number eight. Okay, we are finally getting to the point we want to make now is, so I, I'm gonna switch the, page to the next one. So what's the page number? This is page number three. This is page number four. So equation eight, my friend just had a baby by the way. That's one, he's a professor in Chicago. It's his first kid, so he just sent me a message. That's what happens on screen share. So sorry for the TMI, but uh, so remember equation number three, where we said pressure is equal to Vx square by V multiplied by Mn. And equation number eight just said that average value of Vx square is equal to one by three Vrms square, okay? And equation three said that pressure is equal to Vx square by volume multiplied by mass multiplied by number. Pressure is equal to Vx squared <clears throat> by 
by volume multiplied by mass multiplied by number. So if, so this, this was pressure for a particular velocity X, right? So if you want to talk about the average pressure experienced by the system, so on an average, pressure is equal to average value of Vx square divided by volume, divided by mass, multiplied by mass, multiplied by number. Note that we did not have to do averaging for a mass and number and the volume because we, are, we have a box of a fixed volume. Particle mass is not changing, number of particles is not changing. So in, in this, if we use equation number eight, what do we get? Vx square is one by three Vrms square divided by volume multiplied by Mn. So we get something interesting. We just got Tv is equal to one by three mass multiplied by number multiplied by Vrms squared. This is essentially a restatement of the ideal gas law. In fact, if we go and uh, compare it to the ideal gas law, which says PV is equal to N capital N R T, right? If we compare these two, what do we get? We get N R T is equal to one by three M N V R M S square. And you can cancel out N N N and you are left with V R M S square is equal to three R T by M. And that's a very interesting relation. This is what we said intuitively last time, right? That temperature is proportional to square root of velocity. So there are many ways of doing this in Atkins, if you go to section 1.b.2, which is completely optional, okay? Atkins, and this numbering might change from addition to addition. I think I'm talking about 10th addition. 1.b.2 does it in a more mathematical manner. And those of you who are more mathematically inclined might find it more satisfying. And so what did we do here? We just showed that by assuming we really did it by first principles, right? We thought about molecules that are moving. We calculated the rate of change of momentum. We calculated the number of molecules that are in that box traveling in the right direction. Through this, we calculated the pressure. Then we said we get pressure P in terms of the velocity, but the velocity itself changes. At zero Kelvin, Vx will always be zero. It will be a delta function, vertical. So pressure will be zero. There is no pressure at zero Kelvin. As the temperature increases, this curve broadens more and more and more, uh, and the velocity changes. We said that, okay, let's assume that we know here that the average velocity is zero always because there is no preferred direction, either plus or minus, it's just moving in one direct, either direction. So, but the average of the square is non-zero. And let's say the average of the square is same in every direction, X, Y, and Z. From that, we get that Vx squared is equal to one by three Vrms squared. We use this formula and substitute it over here. So we do a bit of jugglery. We say that pressure, which is instantaneous, depending on one value of Vx, let's think about an average pressure. So for that, we can introduce this average Vx squared. Once we do that, we get an interesting relation that pressure is proportional to the squared of the root mean squared velocity is the Vrms squared. And now we know ideal gas law, so which shows us that Vrms square is equal to three RT by M. So, or Vrms itself is equal to square root of three RT by M. In your homework, you will probably have some problems where I will have you calculate this expression and try to get some intuition into what it means, how it changes. You can see that at zero temperature, Vrms is going to be zero, which makes sense, right? Because we just do the delta function. Nothing, it's, it's just at one speed. So this shows us that higher the temperature, let me make some comments here and I'll move to the next page. So higher the T, what happens to the root mean squared velocity? Does it increase or decrease? 
it increases, right? It's temperature is in the numerator. So if you increase the temperature, higher is V RMS, okay? At the same temperature, what does it tell us about? And the second conclusion is more interesting. At the same temperature, which should have the highest root mean squared velocity, hydrogen or oxygen? All right? Hydrogen. Why? Because it's lower mass. It's lower mass, right? You agree? Well, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So for the purposes of our derivation, we define N as the total number of particles, correct? Yeah. However, for the ideal gas law, isn't M defined as the whole models of gas particles? So wouldn't we need to convert? It's all about what M are you defining? So the jugglery comes from M. Is your M mass of one mole or mass of one particle? So M is all encompassing, all wonderful. Okay. It takes care of everything. Good question, though. These things become confusing, especially when you go to Atkins. Sometimes they have a funky notation. So what, what's your name? Nathan just said that hydrogen will have on an average a higher root mean squared velocity, right? So this, so let me draw it in a, and this might seem obvious to you, but if I draw a plot and now ask you the same question, I am drawing you probability of Vx versus Vx, and I draw you two curves. The black one, is it still black on the screen? Yes, it is black. And Blue one. Now, Nathan, you tell me, which one is hydrogen, which one is oxygen? Blue is hydrogen, uh, black. So the color inversion seems to have removed. That's good. Does anyone disagree with Nathan? Go ahead. What's your name? Hannah. Hannah. So Hannah and Nathan are in a battle. We have to solve their battle. Okay, let's take. Let's. No, you. Oh, don't give up. <laughs> no, it's probably. So do you agree with Nathan? Okay. Hannah, semi grudgingly. No, I think you agree with Nathan. Good. Is there anyone else who disagrees with Nathan? No? Okay, good. Nathan is right. So it's not about the peak, it's about the spread, right? So hydrogen will have a huge, some hydrogen molecules will be moving very slow. Some hydrogen molecules will be moving very fast. But the number of hydrogen molecules that move very fast, let me draw just blue to be consistent, is going to be a large number of them. The scatter will be more. So this VRMS square is really all about scatter, right? So the scatter in velocity will be higher for hydrogen than for oxygen. And that's what we are expressing through this equation. So let me write it down over here. Lighter molecules will have higher VRMS. And that's kind of obvious, but if I had just shown you this plot before this class, I think there would have been more disagreement with Nathan, right? It's, it's not that obvious that why the curve should look like this. It's not that obvious. Okay, good. Any questions about this? So as you can see, the math has picked up in the class. It will keep picking up. And as I mentioned, eight days from now, we will be in deep within using symbols like this. If these things confuse you, and I know, I know they are confusing. I mean, I will be very, very honest. The first time I took calculus, like in, no, first time I took physics in when I was 16 years old, the teacher started writing things like dy by dx. I'm like, why don't you cancel the d and d? Life becomes simple. And the teacher laughed at me. But if you think about it, if it's a linear model, you can cancel d by d, right? If it's a linear model, then dy by dx is equal to y by x. But things become confusing. And these total derivatives and partial derivatives are confusing. There is no one who becomes good at total derivatives and partial derivatives without suffering through them. So please look at the math notes and start thinking to them because I'm, I'm a warning in advance. 
because in the end, let me be very, very clear. In this class, your probability of getting an A or an A plus, your probability of getting an A or an A plus will be a strong function of how good you are in multivariable calculus. There is no denial about it. It's not the only variable that affects your probability of getting an A or an A plus. You need to have intuition. It's, it's not a math class. It's a physical chemistry class, okay? You need to have intuition. But if you suck in multivariable calculus, PCAM is gonna be hard. You will hate it, you will hate me. You will see me on campus, you will be like, I hate this person. <laughs> and I don't want you to hate me, it's not nice, okay? So, next time I'll switch my emails off before. I can't do that because I'm recording on Zoom, otherwise I would have switched the internet off. So, okay. So we just did a basic overview of the kinetic theory. I want to cover one topic very, very quickly. It's a short topic. And then next time, what we are going to do is to look for real gases. Ideal gases don't have interaction, right? If I want you, let me, let me draw a plot here and ask you, and this is really an introduction to next time, but I want you to think about it. And don't start packing up because we still have to do one more thing. So if I, if I think about two molecules, in an ideal gas, okay? There are many, many more, but let's just consider two particles. And I say that the distance between them is R. And think, stay with me now and tell me what is going to be the potential energy for how they interact with each other as a function of R for an ideal gas. Does anyone know how will this plot look like? What should be the value at R is equal to infinity? Do they interact with each other? So we will start from here, right? As we get closer, does this value increase, decrease, stay the same? Who thinks it increases? Don't be shy, okay, some of you think it increases. Why do you think it increases? But they are ideal gas. This is like, what's your name? Marco. Mar Marco? Yeah. So this is like Marco and Nathan, so it's like, Nathan can come and sit next on the chair next to you. You don't care. He can sit five chairs away. You don't care. You only care when he sits on top of you. Then you're very unhappy. You don't like it. So the point being that as you get closer and closer and closer, the energy does not change. You're like, yeah, whatever. You sit where you want. I don't care. Except until you get to R is equal to A, which is the size of a chair. Then what happens to the energy? it blows up. You're like, whoa, Nathan, this is not good. I'm gonna punch you. <laughs> and the you know, fight breaks off, right? And then it just shoots up. So this is how it looks like, something like this, right? It goes to infinity. So this is a potential energy curve for an ideal gas. Technically speaking, for an ideal gas, A also goes to zero, right? A goes to zero. So it becomes like a delta function. It shrinks to zero. Real materials don't have this potential energy. Real material potential energies look something like this. You have an attractive well. That's how, if, if chemistry was made up of materials that had potential energy like this, life wouldn't exist, right? We would all be happy ideal gases, oblivious of each other. But we know molecules are formed, bonds are formed. So a real potential energy looks something like this thing. And for, for a potential energy like this, the equation of state is indeed PV is equal to NRT. For a potential energy like this, PV is equal to NRT is not true. And next time we will see what are the good approximations to a real energy curve, okay? So this, this is, this is we, will, we will not get into the math for that. If you really want the math for how a given energy curve can lead to an equation of state, you should take my graduate class, which is statistical mechanics 687. And those of you who might laugh, every year I have some undergrads from this class who love it so much. They come and take my uh, graduate thermodynamics and, uh, and stagnant class. Every year, there are at least two students who do that. So hopefully this year too. But the, so this we will study next time. Today, I want to just talk about one little final topic, which is what happens to the ideal gas law when you have a mixture of gases, okay? So let's say you have Na moles of gas A, Nb moles of gas B, and uh, just like one of you mentioned, it could have been Na molecules of gas A or Nb molecules of gas B. In that case, you just have to 
correct the mass, whether you're talking about mass of one molecule or mass of, mass of one mole. So in this case, we can define, and let's say this goes on and on. And in this, uh, and in this case, we can define the mole fraction of species A as Na divided by N, Xb is equal to Nb divided by N, right? These are the mole fractions. These are concepts that you have studied in great detail in all the prerequisites for this course. So where N must be equal to Na plus Nb plus Nc, as many as we have, right? So we can now define the partial pressure and I'm introducing partial pressure. We are not going to be using it for a while. When we use it later, I will, I will recap this, but I just want to introduce it here for sake of consistency. Of gas or molecule J, okay, is defined by Pj is equal to the mole fraction of the species J or the gas J multiplied by the total pressure. In other words, Pa is equal to Xa multiplied by P, which is Na multiplied by P by N, Pb is equal to Nb multiplied by P divided by N, so on and so forth. So clearly, P, the net pressure is Pa plus Pb plus Pc. Why? Because you can write down the formula here, right? Pa is Na P by N, Pb is Nb P by N plus dot dot dot. If you do the summation, you will get one over N, Na plus Nb plus Nc plus dot 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 pressure. And we know that Na plus Nb plus Nc is N, right? So N divided by N is P. So therefore this is true. So net pressure is equal to sum of partial pressures. The subtle thing that I want you to keep in mind, this is true for all gases, not just ideal. Did I use PV is equal to NRT in deriving this? I did not, right? I just defined partial pressure. And the reason this is, this is subtle, but it's not profound because I have defined my partial pressure in such a way. It's just the total pressure multiplied by the mole fraction, right? So if you sum up the partial pressures, you get the net pressure. This is true for all gases. Gases where the interaction and energy is like this, or the interaction energy is like this. It could be a quantum mechanical system. I don't care. For any gas, the net pressure is equal to sum of partial pressure, any mixture of gases. There is one approximation which applies for ideal gases. And that is called Dalton's law. Dalton's law, it's called law, even though it applies only to perfect gases, you know, it's what, not much of a law. Dalton's law applies to perfect gases. And this is something that students can get tripped in. And I, I mentioned this also because those of you who are going to take MCAT or those exams, you know, you can get confused in this. They have questions about partial pressures and stuff and it can be confusing. So Dalton's law states that In, in, in an ideal gas, every molecule is unaware of each other, right? Again, Nathan and Marco, they don't care where they are sitting as long as they're not top of each other. And that's not gonna happen because they are both very, very tiny. So the probability of that happening is not, it's very small, right? So for an ideal gas, molecules don't see each other. So for an ideal gas, partial pressure is also the pressure that the gas would have exerted on the container if it was in the container alone, okay? So it's a mouthful, but let me write it down. A partial pressure is also the, and I will be done right after this, pressure each gas would exert if it was alone in the container. It, this is not true for a real gas, right? Because a real gas, if you remove all the other gas particles, you have changed the physics, right? The, it was interacting with other gas particles in a certain way. Think about it this way. The best way to think about it is having cats in this room and having a bunch of dogs in this room, right? If you thought that the cats and dogs were ideal particles, 
the pressure that the cats are exerting on the walls will be the same whether you had dogs or not. That's not going to happen, right? If you had a bunch of dogs, cats would be trying to escape. So that's not really true. But if it was ideal, it would be true. That's what we are saying here. So this Dalton's law is sometimes useful to calculate pressure, but it works only for partial gases. So next time we will meet and talk about which is Monday is holiday. So after that, we will meet and talk about real gases.